Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 797 for December 15th, 2019. Coming up in a few minutes. It's a bit surreal, to be honest. Um, you know, someone who's been around the, the whiskey industry and, and meeting people for a number of years, um, you know, it is a little bit surreal to actually take a concept like this, um, which is all a bit of a crazy dream at the beginning and actually make it into a physical reality. Rob Carpenter is one of the co-founders of Edinburgh's first malt whiskey distillery in nearly a century. Hollyrood Distillery started production back in September, and that has forced Rob to spend most of his time these days in Edinburgh, seven time zones, 4,058 miles, or 6,531 kilometers away from his home in Calgary, Alberta. How did a Canadian energy executive wind up running a distillery in Edinburgh? He'll share his story with us in a few minutes on Whiskey Cast in Depth. We'll also have your voice, the What I'm Tasting This Week department, and a whole lot more, all on this edition of Whiskey Cast. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. And there's good news and bad news this week for whiskey lovers out of Washington. We'll start with the good news. Congress and the Trump administration have reached a tentative agreement on the spending bills that are needed to keep federal agencies funded past this coming Friday. Those bills are expected to be approved in both the House and Senate and would fund the government through the end of the fiscal year next September. What that means for whiskey lovers? The TTB will be able to keep doing label approvals for new releases without a shutdown. There's also a new trade deal with China that's being seen as the first step toward cooling off the trade war between the U.S. and China. However, the details of the deal have not yet been released, so we don't know yet whether it will lead to the end of China's 25% tariff on imports of American whiskeys. That tariff went into effect in the summer of 2018 after the U.S. imposed punitive tariffs on imports of steel and aluminum from China, along with the European Union and several other key trading partners. Canada and Mexico were among the countries initially hit with those tariffs last year, but the tariffs were removed as part of the negotiations over a new free trade agreement. This week, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Trump administration agreed on legislation to implement the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Key points for whiskey lovers here— No tariffs on whiskeys and other spirits, while both Canada and Mexico will continue to recognize U.S. exclusivity for the terms bourbon and Tennessee whiskey. Mexico will also establish protections for the term American rye whiskey. Now for the bad news. The federal excise tax break that small-scale distillers have had for the last two years officially expires at midnight on New Year's Eve. But it really could be dead as soon as this coming Friday night. That's when members of Congress start their holiday break. American Craft Spirits Association leaders spent the week in Washington meeting with congressional leaders. While there is widespread bipartisan support for an extension in both houses, former ACSA President Mark Schilling says the extension is a hostage to other time-sensitive issues. The issue seems to be that 
there are some unrelated tax provisions that different parties want, and there's negotiation happening right now, uh, trying to find some common ground on those things in order to put a package together by the end of next week. Whether or not that will happen is anybody's guess. Some of the offices we've met with were cautiously optimistic. Others were um, a bit more pessimistic that, that any deal would be reached. So, you know, I think our primary uh, initiative right now is to continue making calls and putting pressure specifically on the leadership offices. And, you know, the speaker the minority and, and majority leaders in both houses and, you know, all of the folks who really have a leadership role in this. You met with uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and uh, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer. What did they say, and did you also get to talk to their Republican counterparts in the House and Senate? We did. I, I spoke with, with Schumer directly. We met with uh, Pelosi's uh, tax counsel. And, uh, you know, everyone is positive about this issue. Uh, you know, everyone has a slightly different take on what needs to happen in order to get this across the goal line. Uh, you know, the Senate uh, is waiting for the House to act. It's a tax issue, so it has to start in the House. And my impression uh, is that in the Senate, both parties are pretty much in alignment on let's get something from the house and we're ready to act on it. I think in the house, there's a little bit more discussion about these other provisions and trying to make something work and whether or not they'll come to agreement is the question, which is why I think really what we need to do is keep the pressure on and remind them that the way this, this tax, uh, the FET tax impacts most distillers is that we will have to start making those payments in January, that there is no opportunity for refunds later in the year because the damage is already done. How critical is that extension? Schelling says he knows of craft distillers who could start laying off employees as soon as this Saturday if the tax cut is not extended, and many struggling distilleries might be forced to close in the coming months. You can listen to the entire interview with Mark Schilling in the news section at whiskeycast.com. We'll have updates on the website and on social media this week. In other news, Ireland's Glendaloff Distillery is under new ownership. Canada's Mark Anthony Group took full control of the distillery in County Wicklow this week. The company bought 40% of Glendalaw in 2016 and acquired the remaining 60% from the founders for around 12 million euros. That's about $13.4 million. The new owner plans to expand distribution in the U.S., along with Europe and Asia. Mark Anthony Group's Vancouver-based Wine and Spirits division makes Bareface Canadian whiskey, the company is best known for its White Claw Hard Seltzer and Mike's Hard Lemonade brands. The Whiskey Extravaganza wrapped up its fall series of tastings the other night in Florida, and that event also brings an end to the series, at least under that name. IWSC Group is merging the Whiskey Extravaganza into its Whiskies of the World event series, with plans for events in 15 U.S. cities during 2020. The full schedule will come out next month, but will include all of the cities where the Whiskey Extravaganza held its events, along with at least one new event this April in Nashville. Meanwhile, Chivas Brothers is releasing what may well be one of its rarest Royal Salute whiskeys yet. The Royal Salute 52-year-old single cask finish was finished for its last 14 years in a single cask after blending. Only 106 bottles will be available worldwide, with a recommended retail price in the U.S. of $30,000 each. Earlier this year, Nika released two special whiskies to celebrate the 50th anniversary of its Miyagikyo distillery in Japan. Now there's word that both will be available in the U.S., the Yoichi Limited Edition 2019 includes whiskies from the 1960s through the 2000s. 
So does the Mia Geekyo Limited Edition 2019. But that one also includes some of the first whiskey ever made there. 70 bottles of each will be available in the U.S. at a price of $3,500 each. The whiskey from Israel's Milk and Honey Distillery in Tel Aviv is not that expensive, but like those two whiskeys, it'll be coming to the U.S. for the first time. The distillery's owners have signed a deal with Impax Beverages to import their whiskeys into the U.S. The deal will start with two small batch releases, one peated and one unpeated. There'll be a larger release next summer. A couple of months ago, we reported on the, quote, Ultimate Whiskey Collection auction at Sotheby's in London. That auction brought a total of $9.9 million in bids for what was the largest collection of whiskeys from a single seller. That auction included a new world record for the most expensive bottle of whiskey ever sold at an auction at nearly $1.9 million. Now, the online house whiskey auctioneer is touting plans for two auctions in early 2020 to sell what it is claiming is, quote, the world's largest private whiskey collection to go to auction. The two auctions will feature more than 3,900 bottles collected by the late Richard Gooding of Denver, who made his fortune in the soft drinks business. Gooding died in 2014, and his family decided to sell the collection. It includes two 1926 McAllens, including a twin to the 1926 Fine and Rare Edition that set the record price at that Sotheby's auction, along with one of the 12 bottles with labels designed by artist Valerio Adami. Whiskey auctioneer founder Ian McClune projected the two auctions could bring $10 million in bids. The first auction will begin on February 7th and end on the 17th, while the second will run from April 10th through the 20th. And finally, 10 years ago, we were reporting on what was, at the time, the largest bottle of whiskey ever made. It was a 14-year-old Tom and Tool that held 105.3 liters of whiskey. And as we reported back in September of 2009 in episode 217, it was originally created by the owners of the Whiskey Castle and the Clockhouse Restaurant in Tom and Tool. That bottle eventually went on display at the Scotch Whiskey Experience in Edinburgh, but will now likely be on display in someone's private collection. It was sold in the latest Just Whiskey auction for £15,000 this weekend, or about $20,000. While that one may be the largest bottle of single malt Scotch whiskey ever made, it is no longer the largest bottle of whiskey ever. Back in 2011, Jack Daniels created a bottle that held 184 liters, or 48.6 gallons, to mark the founder's 161st birthday. A year later, Edrington beat that record with a 228-liter bottle of the famous Grouse. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at WhiskeyCast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Larceny Bourbon's heritage goes back to the days when Treasury agent Johnny Fitzgerald was patrolling the Rick Houses of Kentucky, not just for the feds, but also for himself. Fitzgerald was stealing a taste of some of his favorite barrels of weeded bourbon on the side. Today's award-winning Larceny Bourbon has that same soft, smooth character that Fitzgerald loved. Look for 92-proof Larceny Bourbon at your local retailer, and be on the lookout for the upcoming limited edition releases of Larceny Barrel Proof. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. The festival schedule is over now through the holidays, but there are all sorts of tastings, bottle signings, and engraving events going on through the end of the year. You can check out the calendar on our website for the most updated list. Now, once the calendar turns over to January, the National Whiskey Festival kicks off 2020 in Glasgow, Scotland on the 5th. The Arctic Whiskey Festival is January 11th in Tromso, Norway. And the San Antonio Cocktail Conference runs from January 15th 
through the 19th in San Antonio, Texas. The Edmonton MS Whiskey Festival is on the 15th, followed the next night by the Calgary MS Whiskey Festival, and the Victoria Whiskey Festival gets underway that same night in Victoria, British Columbia. It runs through the 19th, and I hope you'll join us for special coverage that weekend from Victoria. The L&B Whiskey Weekend is on the 17th and 18th in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and in Louisville, Kentucky, the Bourbon Brotherhood and the Whiskey Chicks are joining forces for a party to mark the 100th anniversary of Prohibition on the 17th. Also in Louisville, the Kentucky Derby Museum kicks off its annual Bourbon Masters series with an evening with brand new Bourbon Hall of Fame inductee Peggy No Stevens on the 23rd. That's followed on the 30th by a night with Buffalo Trace's Freddie Johnson and February 6th when Heaven Hill master distiller Connor O'Driscoll will be on hand. Right now, we have 183 different events on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a festival, a tasting, or any other whiskey-related event coming up, we'd love to help you spread the word. Just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. We'll add it to the list. From deep in the north... Far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Last September, Holyrood Distillery became the first working malt whiskey distillery in Edinburgh in nearly a century when its stills came to life. The distillery was in the works for nearly six years and it's a unique cooperation between Canada and Scotland, though it's 100% Scotch whiskey. Let me explain. Canadian whiskey entrepreneur Rob Carpenter and longtime Scotch whiskey industry leader David Robertson teamed up back in 2013 to start working on the distillery. Rob and his wife Kelly are based in Calgary, Alberta. They also own the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society's Canadian chapter, and Rob also had a career on the side in the oil and gas industry. But now he's 100% focused on whiskey and splitting his time between Canada and Edinburgh, which is where I caught up with him on the phone the other day. First of all, tell me what it's like having to be bicontinental, switching between Calgary and Edinburgh all the time. It's a bit challenging because uh, not not least of which personally because my my wife and I um, you know don't uh, necessarily always <laughs> live in the same place anymore and you know that's uh, that's not good for either of us but um, you know from a business perspective I'm I'm mostly based in Edinburgh now because uh, you know the demands of of this business require me to be here and. Uh, you know, so, so you know, from that perspective, it's not a, a, a huge amount of traveling for me right now. We've never really talked about this, but how did you wind up being the managing director or and one of the founders of Hollyrood Distillery all the way from Calgary? Because we didn't really hear much about your involvement at first. At that time, it was mostly uh, Dave Robertson that was involved, or at least the front man for the project. Well, the, I mean, the reality of this is that until, uh, we started the fundraise in, uh, mid 2017, I was very much behind the scenes, um, because I was still, uh, doing my day job with, uh, a big oil and gas pipeline company in Calgary. And, uh, so to, to make sure, you know, that, that role wasn't threatened, which was, uh, helping support a lot of the development costs. Of this, um, we decided that David would sort of be the front man for a while, 
until we started the fundraise. And at that time, I'd left my previous job and uh, became sort of involved on a very much on a day-to-day basis. But you know, I've I've certainly been uh, involved with this since late 2013 when I I first sort of roped David into the concept, um, and uh, and that's where it all began. And since then, you have a distillery. You're producing spirit. You're getting ready to release a gin and maybe something else in the next few weeks. What's it been like? It's a bit surreal, to be honest. Um, you know, someone who's been around the, the whiskey industry and, and meeting people for a number of years, um, you know, it is a little bit surreal to actually take a concept like this, um, which is all a bit of a crazy dream at the beginning and actually make it into a physical reality and seeing filled the casks at the warehouse and trying new make spirit and seeing our gin for sale in retail shops and on the bars and so on is, is really quite, um, uh, you know, I don't know that there's any other word than surreal. Not quite unlike having your first kid, I would think almost, right? Well, it's, uh, it's not quite the same, but um, it is, yeah, it's certainly almost like, um, you know, uh, having, you know, having a child of a different nature in a way and then, and then nurturing it because there's still a lot of work to, to be done. There's, uh, you know, getting, getting the doors open and getting distilling is one thing, but, um, you know, one needs to, to then nurture the business and uh, get it to the next stage, which you know, it's hopefully getting into other markets, uh, certainly with the gins, first of all, and then ultimately in a few years with, with our whiskeys. I would think almost that raising children and raising a whiskey distillery are almost sort of alike because, in some ways, because they both take a few years to mature. They do, and uh, they can certainly be temperamental along the way. There's always little unexpected things that uh, one needs to deal with um, pretty much on a daily basis. But, um, you know, the other uh, similarity, I think, is that, um, you know, they're very rewarding. It's very rewarding to see something develop and um, and grow and become more mature and, and so on. So, uh, you know, together with all the challenges of, of any new business, whether that's in the whiskey industry or otherwise, um, you know, you see the rewards of it as well in terms of progress. Where do you sit right now in terms of cask inventory and uh, getting closer to being able to bottle your own whiskey? We started uh, filling casks in early September. And right now, I think, you know, we've got probably 125 casks in the warehouse, um, bar whiskey, so, you know, that's not, uh, that's not too bad a start. Um, we're still, uh, still, as, you, as we will be for a number of months yet, um, you know, improving our efficiencies with running the equipment, et cetera. And, uh, so, you know, that'll, that'll take a little while, but, you know, we'll continue to, to probably do a couple of mashes a day for the foreseeable future. So that's, uh, you know, that's keeping our distillers busy. And of course, because we're using specialty malts and things like that, every every mash um, or every time you use a new uh, malt recipe, it's it's a little bit different. We learn something about how that malt recipe uh, mashes, how it ferments, and how it it um, it distills. So, you know, that's uh, that's quite challenging for our distillers. Let's give your distillers some credit here. Who do you have working for you? We have uh, four uh, distillers right now. Of course, Jack Mayo is uh, our distillery manager, and and Jack comes from from Glasgow Distillery and uh, a very impressive, intelligent, creative guy. And then he's got three distillers working for him. One is Elizabeth Mackin, and, uh, and another is Ollie Salveson. They're fairly new to the industry, both having come out of Harriet Watt in the last year or two. And then Elliot Rogerson, who's the newest addition to the team. And Elliot um, uh, is, is a very practical, hands-on guy. He's, he's worked at Stuart Brewing and Caledonian and 
and so on. So he probably has a little bit more practical on the ground experience. So amongst them, and they're a great team. I mean, they really work well together. And I would imagine that at least the biggest bulk of your business right now is the visitor center. Yes, that's right. Um, uh, we have our visitor center, which uh, is right in the middle of Edinburgh. It's a, it's a 15 minute walk off the Royal Mile, if people know Edinburgh. So that's, uh, you know, that's a 15 minute walk from sort of tourism central. So we are very, very uh, central in Edinburgh. And we do have a, a visitor center that takes um, our visitors through both uh, making gin and making whiskey because we have separate distilling equipment for each. Or we also have options where people can do a very, very gin-focused tour or a very whiskey-focused tour, depending on what their preferences are. How many visitors are you getting through there in a month? Uh, I would imagine this is the uh, sort of the slack time of the year during the winter now as we're getting into uh, December. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, it's uh, Edinburgh is almost an all all year round tourist city right now. But uh, um, yeah, November, uh, this early December is a, a little bit quieter. But we're certainly seeing it pick up towards the Christmas season. Um, there's lots of things to do in Edinburgh around Christmas. So lots of tourists come back to the city, uh, even in Scottish weather. Um, so yeah, we are, we're certainly seeing the visitor numbers grow and, um, you know, we're hoping that we will, uh, hit 60,000 visitors next year. You mentioned the, uh, Scottish weather. What's more hospitable, Scottish weather or Calgary weather this time of year? Oh, well, they're both so different. Um, Calgary can get its, its snow, but it also get its, gets its, uh, Chinooks, which are a nice, respite and, and, and wide blue prairie skies um, where Scotland can, you know, get its rain. But right now it's, um, it's a nice crisp day here. And, um, you know, and as I say, without the rain, you can't make the whiskey. And I'm sure that Edinburgh does not get the butt-numbing cold that Calgary does during the winters. No, uh, it doesn't get as cold, but uh, but it also doesn't get the Chinook either that uh, that can get Calgary quite quite warm during, even during the winter. But anyways, it's um, it's it's nice to be able to experience both. So I'm, I I guess I get the best of both worlds. We talked with Gareth Roberts, uh, an architect who is working on a bunch of the small craft distilling projects around Scotland, and a lot of his projects are building from the ground up. You guys had a more unique challenge with Holyrood in that you went into a railway shed, and I think it's a listed building, if I'm not mistaken. So our our building is is owned by Enver Council, and uh, it's a 185 year old um, stone um, storage shed associated with uh, one of the very first railways in the UK, which was uh, nicknamed. As the innocent railway and brought coal into Edinburgh to heat homes and businesses. And so this is the last remaining building associated with that, that railway. And it's, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful building and it fits our purposes, uh, wonderfully. So, you know, we're very proud to be the custodians of it. But you couldn't make many changes to the exterior because of the historic character, right? No, uh, we couldn't make changes to the exterior, but that's all right because the exterior doesn't, uh, doesn't really need any changes. Um, certainly with the interior, we have, uh, we have changed a significant amount, um, to fit in all the distilling equipment and the visitor experience, et cetera. How hard was it to shoehorn all that stuff in? It was, uh, very difficult. Uh, we, it is um, a long, relatively narrow building, and to fit in all the equipment we had to be, and our engineers in particular, had to be quite creative. Um, uh, so, so we don't have the luxury of having, you know, a, a fairly big industrial space with uh, lots of height and, um, and floor area to sort of spread equipment around. We've had to stack equipment and shoehorn tanks in and pumps and so on in underneath equipment. But it, it works and, um, you know, it's making great spirit and that's in the end all that really matters. It doesn't leave you much room for expansion though, right? No, 
uh, we certainly wouldn't be looking at expanding in, in this area, but um, and the reality is we have additional distilling capacity we can make use of uh, even in this location. So, you know, we've got to get the product out there. It's a number of years before we're uh, even going to be thinking about uh, producing much more than we are now. I am told you may be announcing a new spirit here very soon. You want to give us a, a sneak preview? Well, like uh, like many things, uh, many other distilleries, uh, we are looking at uh, giving people a taste of what's coming off the still. So we're going to uh, look at releasing a couple of Activite products. And um, because we are very flavor-focused here, and we're doing um, several different flavor styles through through different specialty malts that we're using and different uh, yeasts that we're using, we are going to be doing a couple of different acavites. Um, and a little teaser is one of them is going to be a bit of a smoky one. Interesting. Going back to the uh, old Reiki days of Edinburgh with a little bit of peat, I assume? That's right, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's... Um, it's it's fun to just sort of experiment with things. We have done uh, a peated run through our stills already, which um, some people might find a little heretical um, coming from an Edinburgh distillery, but uh, we're certainly not going to be constrained by um, any suggestions that we're a lowland style and should be light and fruity. We'll We'll do lots of different things here. Now let's turn to your other job running the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society in Canada with Kelly. You guys are coming back to Victoria two years after the uh, infamous Victoria Whiskey Festival of uh, 2018. Tell me about it. Well, uh, you know, Kelly and I, you know, love the Victoria Whiskey Festival. And, uh, you know, the it's, a, it's a, a, as you well know, Mark, you know, it's a fantastically run festival. And, um, you know, we have really missed our involvement in that since, as you, as you say, sort of the infamous events of, of 2018 when, uh, you know, government inspectors raided, uh, the bars and restaurants serving, uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society products. So, you know, Kelly and I talked about it and we talked to the festival organizers and, you know, we decided uh, that we wanted to to be back at the festival and and be part of it again and support the charitable work that it does. So we're going to be back there in in January again this year. How did you work out the legalities to be able to pour your stuff? Because the uh, province's liquor distribution board insists that it has to supply all of the whiskeys that are poured. Yeah, and, you know, Kelly and I take some exception to that because, you know, as a small brand, um, and we're not the only ones in this boat, there are other small producers and, and craft breweries, et cetera, that are not big enough to be carried in government liquor stores. And so it really is a bit um, unfair and anti-competitive of the government to force um, ambassadors and agents of those products that buy through the government liquor store rather than letting them buy through the private stores that do support those kinds of producers. But um, Kelly and I, in the circumstances, decided to uh, sort of um, bite our tongues and work through the BCLDB system for now because really from our perspective, there's a bigger um, argument to be made by being at Victoria Whiskey Festival, and that is that uh, we want to continue uh, pushing um, for the right of BC consumers um, to to be able to enjoy products in bars and restaurants that are purchased from private liquor stores. Um, And right now, BC consumers are not able to do that. And it's frankly very anti-competitive of the BC government to uh, to support that kind of policy at the retail uh, liquor level. And Kelly and I want to be back in Victoria and remind people of that. So the fact that we had to acquire our products through the 
BC uh, liquor distribution branch processes is a small price to pay to be able to make the argument. And we should point out that the bars and restaurants that were getting their product through your two retail outlets, Legacy Liquor Store in Vancouver and the Strath in Victoria, were actually getting stuff that had to go through the liquor distribution board system to begin with because the private stores still had to get their stuff in. It's just that it wasn't cataloged as being for sale in the provincial system. That's right. I mean, the BC system requires bars and restaurants to buy everything that they put on their back bar and pour for the patrons through a BC government liquor store. So those bars and restaurants are not allowed to buy from a private liquor store. However, every alcohol product in British Columbia still has to go through the BC government system. And Kelly and I you know, follow all the rules in, in doing that and in making our products available uh, in BC and all taxes are paid and, and so on. So really, it's not an issue that anyone's skirting any of the rules. Um, it's a process whereby the government um, has decided that it wants to keep all the profits um, through serving the hospitality sector in British Columbia and deny those kinds of returns to private liquor stores, which... I find fundamentally unfair and frankly is a disservice to BC consumers because why shouldn't they be able to go out to a bar or a restaurant and have a wine or a beer or a whiskey that is not available in a BC government liquor store. I know that Kelly tweeted out earlier this week under the SMWS Canada official account that, uh, you guys had actually considered pulling out of BC at one point. Well, BC is a, a challenging uh, regulatory environment. You know, it's uh, challenging from a bureaucratic perspective and from a taxation perspective. Um, but, um, you know, we're going to uh, stick with it because we have lots of society members in British Columbia and, you know, we, we are really doing uh, what we do with the society because of, of our members in Canada and, and the fact that they continue to support the brand and, and love the product. So, you know, as long as they continue to do that, we'll, we'll jump through the hoops that we need to jump through. And, uh, you know, what's unfortunate, uh, it seems, in the last year or so is that um, there's been a couple of festivals in British Columbia which have been going for years which have had to shut recently because of um, a deteriorating relationship with the the liquor regulators in British Columbia. So that's a bit of a, a, a shame um, because those, those are all charitable uh, fundraisers, those events. They're not for profit. And um, so charities lose out and whiskey consumers lose out. And it really seems that, you know, a, a big reason for that is is, you know, the government seems to be um, kind of going backwards in, in its, uh, its sort of oversight and bureaucracy that's um, applying on these. Is there a possibility, I guess, at some point that by continuing to do this, it keeps the door open for Hollywood's whiskeys to get into B.C. at some point? Uh, in what sense, Mark? Well, I mean, in terms of if you've still got the relationship with the LDB, when it comes time for Hollywood's single malts to be available on the market, at least it keeps the door open to where you've got that relationship with your retailers and your customers that know what you're doing in Scotland, so it makes it a little easier to get your whiskeys off the ground when you hit BC. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think because, you know, Kelly and I um, are familiar with with some of the, a couple of the provinces in Canada, it certainly will make it easier to, uh, to get our, uh, Hollywood whiskeys into, you know, the Canadian market in due course. Um, we are actually already sort of, uh, shipping in the Hollywood gin, um, which, uh, you know, we'll, we'll gradually expand the footprint of hopefully, but, um, yeah, certainly the relationship in Canada is, is very helpful. Let's get back to the distillery for a second. What was it like when you saw your first new mate come off the still? Well, very exciting. 
And uh, unfortunately, I actually wasn't there when it first started coming off because I had to uh, had to do a bunch of work up at the warehouse and uh, and was doing some other things. So didn't quite make it back in time by the time they turned the handle and, and started running New Spirit. But I was uh, I got there while it was still running, and um, it is yeah, it is again surreal to sort of um, watch that that first distillation come off. Um, it is, um, I'm not sure there's, there's sort of words because there's just, you know, so many people have put in so much work. And it's not uh, by any means just David and I, it's all the professional team that have been so supportive of this and, and done a huge amount of work. And, and uh, you know, the other staff here that have, have jumped in and, enthusiastically sort of join the effort. So I think it's really exciting for everybody. One other note on the project to turn that old train shed into a working distillery. This past week, Holyrood Distillery was named as one of the finalists in the Scottish Property Awards for Regeneration Project of the Year. Edinburgh's 7N Architects did the design work. Blythe and Blythe was the engineering consultant and construction management came from ISG and the David Adamson Group. It's the only distillery project among the five shortlisted finalists. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with a couple of holiday releases. India's Paul John has released its 2019 Christmas Edition single malt. It's finished in Pedro Jimenez casks with a hint of peated malt, and it's bottled at 46% ABV. The nose has notes of orange marmalade, toffee, raisins, honey, and a slight nuttiness. The taste is thick, fruity, and complex with touches of, appropriately, Christmas cake, along with baking spices and hints of smoke, honey, almonds, and cocoa in the background. The finish is long and subtle with touches of Christmas cake, almonds, and just a kiss of smoke. I'm scoring the Paul John 2019 Christmas Edition a 92. This past week, I received a sample of the Whiskey Exchange's 2019 Black Friday release. It's a 21-year-old single malt from an undisclosed Speyside distillery, and it's bottled at 53.1% ABV. All we know about the distillery is that it's located somewhere between Elgin and Forest, and its whiskeys are not usually available as single malts. There are several distilleries that meet that description. The nose is heavy on tropical fruits with hints of pineapple, mango, lemon, and lime, along with subtle spices and a hint of brown sugar. The taste is creamy and tart with citrus fruits, hints of cinnamon and brown sugar, a nice oaky touch, and a bit of apricot that comes alive leading into the finish, and complements subtle lingering hints of cinnamon, brown sugar, and citrus. I'm scoring the Whiskey Exchange's 2019 Black Friday Single Malt a 93. I'll have more tasting notes for you in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Rye Whiskey was distilled by America's original risk takers and history makers. You see, those first barrels of whiskey were bold, flavorful, and full of passion, and Sagamore Spirit proudly picked up the torch with their spring-fed Maryland-style rye whiskey. It celebrates the grit and glory of those patriotic ancestors who sipped their way into American history. Visit SagamoreSpirit.com to explore their award-winning spirit. Whistlepig Rye's latest Boss Hog release is nicknamed the Samurai Scientist in honor of Japanese chemist Jokichi Takamine. A century ago, he brought the Japanese Koji style of fermentation to the U.S. The Samurai Scientist is 16 years old 
and was finished in Japanese umeshu casks from Kitaya. It's a single-barrel bottling, so the ABV will vary slightly between 60 and 61% ABV. My sample was at 61%. The nose is aromatic and warm, with a strong note of maple syrup and touches of bacon, baking spices, and honey. The taste is intense with clove, cinnamon, charred oak, and hints of pipe tobacco and vanilla. The finish is long and complex with charred oak, lingering spices, vanilla, and a hint of maple syrup. This Boss Hog has excellent balance and complexity. It's the first one released since the death of Dave Pickerel last winter, and I think he'd be proud of it. I'm scoring the Whistle Pig Rye Boss Hog Samurai Scientist a 94. Winter is a time for peated whiskeys, and I received a sample of the latest Balconis Peated Texas Single Malt the other day. It's distilled using peated Golden Promise Barley imported from Scotland, and it's three years old. The ABV, a whopping 65.2% ABV. The nose has notes of lightly smoked barbecued beef, hazelnut, honeycomb, berry cobbler, and vanilla. The taste has a good balance of oak tannins, smoke, baking spices, and touches of grilled peaches, brown sugar, and toasted caramel. The finish is long and slightly astringent, with a hint of smoke, oak tannins, and lingering spices. I'm scoring the Balcones Peated Texas Single Malt 2019 Edition a 91. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of 2,700 different whiskeys from around the world. Check it out today at whiskeycast.com. Everyone knows the expression, "'Tis better to give than to receive." At Redbreast, we don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Maybe it's better to give Redbreast and receive. Like receiving a glass or two right away for your thoughtful gift of Ireland's definitive single pot still whiskey. Or receiving that, hey, thanks again for that bottle of red breast, a month later. Or receiving that shout out in a wedding speech for introducing the groom to red breast, completely overlooking the fact that you introduced him to his bride as well. What we're trying to say is, introducing someone to red breast will come back to you in unexpected ways. Red breast. You've landed on something special. Now, be sure to share it. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Lot 40. Our latest whiskey photo of the week featured a bottle of Nelson's Greenbrier Tennessee Whiskey with a label design that revives the Nelson family's original Greenbrier packaging from way back before Prohibition. And our photo received a bunch of comments. Matt Kelly posted this on our Facebook page. Hmm, that label is stunning. Love the design. Scott Rogers added, I love those old labels. Great to see one back on shelves. And Ron Nadell chimed in. I've loved their Bell Mead whiskeys. I'd try anything by these guys. Our pal Angelo Veneziano from just down the road in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, had this comment on Twitter. Very pretty in a, I just found this dusty in a weird Pine Barrens liquor store kind of way. And on LinkedIn, Nancy Donovan commented, I like the retro look of this label. Meanwhile, Sherry Wong at Anagram2112 on Twitter sent this to us the other day. House made hazelnut truffles and a McAllen 12. Did I do right, Whiskey Cast? Hashtag Whiskey Nirvana. Well, it sounds good to me, Sherry, but I can't tell without tasting the truffles. I'm sure they're good, though. Of course, it's traditional to leave milk and cookies out for Santa Claus on Christmas Eve. And when the Oreo Cookies social media team reminded folks of that on Twitter this week, I fired back, Oh, please, Santa wants single malt whiskey and Oreo cookies. Well, I wound up apologizing to all of our friends who make whiskeys other than single malts. Remember, gang, Santa likes whiskeys of all kinds. Whiskey is what makes the Christmas magic work. But Jens Tholstrup tweeted this from Denmark. 
It works with good Aquavit, too, in Scandinavia. Wonder if that's why we get the presents already on the 24th. Have a merry one. Greg B. at GMB1326 tweeted, and you can probably skip the cookies. Here's where it gets a bit ugly. My oldest daughter, Brianna, tweeted this. Did you actually suggest Santa prefers store-bought over mom's famous cookies? I most certainly did not. We leave the homemade ones out for Santa, but not everyone has access to mom's cookies. But we do always leave a glass of whiskey out with the cookies. You see, the last time we left milk instead of whiskey, the old fart left me a pooper scooper for the dogs. But I will leave the last word on this to Mikey Joe Drum on Twitter. I think he shouldn't fly and drive. What the kids should do is leave him a really nice unopened single malt that he can take back to the North Pole, with a winking emoji. I'll give you that one, Mikey Joe. Remember, there is no excuse for drinking and driving, or drinking and flying in this case, not during the holidays or any day of the year. Let's all be careful this holiday season, and responsible too. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at WhiskeyCast. Or you can just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all that other stuff that combined to make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. I mentioned Koji fermentation a couple of minutes ago in my tasting notes for the Whistlepig Rye Boss Hog Samurai Scientist, and I dare you to try to say that name three times fast after drinking a dram or two. The subject, though, is what exactly is koji fermentation, and how does it differ from traditional sour mash fermentation? Let's go back to sour mash for a minute. It's the way most whiskeys are made today. Distillers will take a small amount of the leftover slurry from a still run and add it to their next batch of mash along with the yeast to start fermentation. That slurry is known as backset, and it's full of spent yeast and enzymes that help kickstart the fermentation process and produce more alcohol. It's very similar to the process for making sourdough bread. And, by the way, the name comes from the term souring the mash by adding that backset and changing the pH. It does not make the whiskey taste sour. And distillers that don't use backset are making what's known as a sweet mash whiskey. Koji-style fermentation, though, is completely different, and it's the way sake and shochu are fermented in Japan. Koji is usually made by adding a mold culture known as Aspergillus orize to cooked rice and letting it rest in a hot, humid environment for a couple of days. During that time, the Aspergillus orize breaks down the complex carbohydrates in that rice into simple sugars, along with amino and fatty acids. Now, Juichi Takamine suggested that the Aspergillus orize culture could be adapted to whiskey distilling. You see, distillers generally use a small amount of malted barley in their mash bills. That's because the malting process creates enzymes that help convert the starches in corn, rye, wheat, and other grains into sugars during mashing. Eventually, the yeast can feed on those sugars during fermentation and Takamine thought that his koji-style process could replace the need to use expensive malt. Instead of using rice, though, he used wheat bran. And Takamine was right. But since the culture added its own unique flavors to the spirit, it hasn't been widely used over the years. But his process did lead to the use of enzyme additives that increased the conversion of starches into sugars during mashing. Not every country allows the use of those enzyme additives. For instance, it is illegal in Scotland. But 
When you're using a mash of 100% malted barley, the grain generally has enough enzymes on its own to take care of stuff. I want to give full credit to Clear Spring Limited and BostonApothecary.com for supplying the source information that we used in this segment. And if you have something you'd like us to look at on a future episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you can find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast. You'll also find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. If you'd like to make sure that you never miss an episode of Whiskey Cast, just click on the subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. That way, you'll get every episode as soon as it drops. And don't forget to share Whiskey Cast with your friends, too. We'd love to hear from you. You can always use the contact form at whiskeycast.com. Get in touch with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2019, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.